We'll look first at the foundational pieces, and then I think there'll be uh, two other pieces to this. One, what are some practical things that folks can do to lead change? And then some things that I think are a little more transformal, transformational, not transformal, transformational, that I think that ultimately um, the leaders that are out there on the edge right now are thinking about in deep ways. And so, um, yeah, Mitch, if you'll take me to my next slide. Thank you there. Um, so the first uh, piece of the puzzle that I think really, really matters, you know, we're at a day and age where we have knowledge, we have information uh, coming at us faster than we can probably handle, and we really do know what the best practices are around so much of what we do in education. Uh, not that it's happening in every place or every classroom or every school district, but we know what they are. Uh, the debate really is around the details at this point in time. We know that students need to be engaged. We know that students need some level of personalization. We know that uh, the way we grade kids matters. We know that the type of information that we give kids matters. Uh, we, know, we know all these things, uh, yet we're finding that uh, the transfer isn't happening. And so I, I come to ask oftentimes, why isn't um that happening and I, I come down to i see so many leaders uh, that have slipped from being leaders into being managers uh, either they're incentivized to be a manager uh, or uh, they lack the will to lead it's hard to be a leader uh, it's hard to be in those spaces uh, in some places i think it's about courage uh, and i'll talk about that here in a second but also there's just a huge amount of energy that it takes to be a great leader these days. It completely throws your life out of balance. It makes it super difficult uh, to be able to um, be able to have um, life balance, if that's even possible. But one of the things that I'm finding is that the best leaders that I know right now that are affecting change are always having yes days. That's, I love this graphic here about yes. Uh, we find so many places where no is the predominant answer or, predo or no is the predominant mental model that exists. And un unfortunately, uh, you can see this in the first five minutes you walk into school. You walk into a school and look around and see how many times the word no is written in the foyer. No cell phones, no hats, no one allowed in here without permission. Uh, the word no is plastered around schools all over the place and you quickly get a sense of whether there's a culture of yes or a culture of no uh, and we know that the most effective change leaders are saying yes uh, probably 10 times more than they say no uh, they're saying to folks yes and let's figure it out because uh, i oftentimes say if people say yes but uh, they might as well have said no it's about the same sort of context so i think it's really important uh, for folks looking to impact change to increase the amount of time that they're saying yes every day to people. You know, ultimately ideas fall flat um, upon their own weight. They don't need a leader to say no uh, right away. And what I find is that professionals bring me excellent ideas all the time. And the last thing you can do is if you say no, uh, recognize that they're going to go tell 10 other people don't even bring your idea forward because he's going to say no. And so I think one of the big, you know, foundational pieces of change leadership is changing the amount of time that as a leader you're saying yes to people. I'm going to go on to the next one. Yeah, I love this uh, quote by Churchill about courage is that, you know, courage is going from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. So hopefully you're hearing uh, some level of my enthusiasm. Maybe I need to turn it up a little bit uh, today, but I, I truly love the challenge that I get every day in, in trying to make change. And I think that we need all of our leaders, um, and you know, I, I go down to student leaders even when I say this. Uh, we need leaders that are ultimately energized about the possibility that they are going to fail um, or have failure that's a part of their day. They see it as a challenge, they see it as exciting, and they keep that energy level going. And so, um, you know, I, I don't know how to reinsert courage into someone. So as we are hiring people, 
uh, to lead our classrooms and lead our buildings and lead in our districts, I think we have to ferret out this idea of courage uh, because without that courage alone, um, it is hard to instill that in folks. And once people get to a place in time where they're just managing, it's hard to get people back into a leadership mode. Uh, the first book I wrote was really about this in a lot of ways, that um, looking at a narrative of someone that tries to break from being a manager back into being a leader. And um, I think it's um, a really, really hard thing to do. So as people are hiring or looking for the right people, how are you measuring the courage that people have? How are you measuring whether they've made courageous decisions in the past and whether they'll do so in the future? Put the next one here. Thanks, Mitch. One of the things I'm also great change leaders do is avoid this in their organization. I don't know if everyone's familiar with the idea of tall poppy syndrome, but I spent some time with uh, my friends in New Zealand recently, and they were explaining to me that um, as a culture, they said the Kiwis are notorious for not uh, respecting, celebrating, uh, loving the idea of people sticking their heads up above anyone else. And so a tall poppy in these poppy fields, often uh, the farmers will go through and chop them off because they absorb more of the sunlight, they absorb more of the nutrients. Uh, but instead, uh, what we're finding is that um, excellent leaders are finding ways to celebrate the excellent people in their building because what they know is that if you spend time um, with mediocrity, and you allow mediocrity to set in your organization, it will eat the organization alive. It is, I think, the thing that eats schools. Um, we have a lot of systems in place in schools that promote mediocrity. And as more mediocrity exists in a system, everyone gets sucked back into the middle. And so if you have a organization or, that, or a classroom that you're a part of, and you're seeing anyone that's a part of that system uh, chopping the heads off of the excellent people. Uh, hey, Mr. Smarty Pants, sit down. Or, oh, he's the one that's always winning the awards. Those kind of comments um, are kind of, you know, bullying terms around excellence. And so uh, the best change leaders I know are always fighting back against mediocrity. And, you know, I, I think it's important, you know, I always talk about leaders leading out loud. To talk about the difference between, you know, bragging and sharing as an organization. The best change leaders are finding ways to go out there and really, really share the tremendous things that are going on. And some people would say, oh, all you're doing is bragging about your school. But, you know, as we have a real problem uh, in education with not being out there sharing the good things that are going on. Uh, instead, we get caught in the trap of one story that we tell about one kid that um, does something wrong and people's mental models of school or that that every kid is just like that. Um, so how do we fight back against Paul, tall poppy syndrome? I think that's a big piece of leadership. And then the last slide that I have on this section, and then uh, I'll pause for a minute and give people a couple seconds to reflect here. Um, you know, I don't think that we can ask people to do more. Um, and we get caught in this trap. Um, teachers say, I can't do one more thing. Uh, we know that student stress level is an all-time high. We can't say, we need you to do more. Uh, we really, really have to think about what it means to do different and not more uh, as organizations, as cultures, as communities. How do we do things uh, in a different type of way to really support um, what's going on and the change that's necessary? So change can't come with, we're going to change and add. I think we have to do change and different as a big key to that. So I'm going to just take a pause for reflection here uh, on my next slide and uh, ask you to reflect on which of these have you seen most lacking? Uh, is it uh, something like tall poppy syndrome where we're not celebrating success? Uh, is it uh, people just asking folks to do more without doing different? Um, what is it exactly in these foundational areas that you have seen that is most that are that's most lacking and uh, 
a little bit of why. So just a little self-reflection. I'm going to actually pause for about a minute and a half and let folks do that. And then we'll come back and talk about some practical things that change leaders can do. Hi, so this, uh, this is Mitch Weisberg and I'm back again. Uh, what, uh, because of the way we started today with a brief conversation, what, we, what I did not do is explain a little bit about the Shindig program. Uh, so one of the things that we really love about Shindig is if you click on another person's icon, uh, you see you see a few icons on the bottom of your screen, then you can have a private video chat with that person. And you see that Bob now is one of the people whose icons are at the bottom of the screen. So if you were, if you have a video setup, so you have a, a web ca webcam on your computer and you have sound and you have... Um, you have uh, speakers or, or a headphone like, like I have, uh, you could click on his icon and then you can have a private video conference with him and, uh, and you can ask these questions your, yourself. Um, our purpose right now is for you to, uh, to form a small group uh, on one or two other people and, um, and discuss with them is, is the things that are stopping change from take, taking place in your school or your district or even your state, how much of that is because the, uh, the leaders are working more as managers rather than leaders? How much of it is that they're falling into the tall poppy syndrome and the, the system is cutting down to size people who are starting to do things more or different? Or how much of it is because people are, in the pro, are, are used to saying no rather than saying yes and and finally how much is how much of the cha the lack of change can be attributed to the fact that possibly people are being asked to do more instead of doing things differently so if you can click on another person's icon and you can discuss that with with yourselves uh then uh, I'll bring Bob back up in a second and maybe he can talk about this with you all as well, or maybe Bob and I will have a conversation. So I'm going to come down for a minute. I'm going to leave this slide up on the screen, which is uh, which of these have you seen most lacking and why? And um, you know, and I and I hope that you take advantage of this opportunity to talk with each other about uh, what holding back the type of changes that you want to see in, in, from from taking place in your district. Or your school. Hi, so I'm back, and I'm uh, hoping that uh, Bob is ready to come back also. And so, what I think I'm going to do is uh, stop the slides and spotlight Bob. Are you there? I am. Thanks. Oh, cool. So, were you able to uh, talk with any of the participants about um, what's going on in their schools or districts? Yeah, uh, Gary and I talked uh, for a few moments, and uh, you know, we both just agreed that shared vision and hiring are just core to this work. Right? Mm -hmm. And you almost uh, know that it, 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 spending time on those two things will get you some of the best value add and change that you can uh, make. And so I did okay. try to jump in there with Lisa. Yeah. I'm not sure what's happening, but I'm going to try to jump over well, and talk to her uh, when we get that. Okay. So I, I was I, actually I was talking to Lisa earlier. It turns out that uh, she needed to uh, change her settings a little bit to pick up her head her headset. And uh, once once she did that, uh, we were we were able to chat. One of the things that I'm thinking mm -hmm. of doing is uh, maybe I'll bring Gary up here so the two of you could just summarize what the two of you talked about. And um, maybe we can get that recorded also. So let me let me great. stop me and let me let me pull Gary up. Hey Gary, uh, w one of the things that you had mentioned to me was uh, some specific criteria that you looked for, and I know that's certainly different for every job. But just talk about how you. Um, Develop some of those specific criteria for when you hired folks. Well, this in one particular situation, I had said to Bob that I um, interviewed a hundred people in order to select eight, and that was in response, Bob, to your saying you had a hundred and fifty applicants, and how many met the criteria? Yeah, maybe ten, maybe maybe eleven. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and I think those that those statistics 
to the extent that they would hold if we expanded the, um, you know, the sample um, are very telling. That the, that few number of people have um, a clear idea about what it's going to take to make a significant change. Um, and it, in an existing school or district where you have a culture and you're trying to shift the culture, that is an enormous undertaking. And I think you said, Bob, it, it will eat you alive. Uh, I mean, I think it was Drucker who first said that uh, a culture will eat strategy for lunch any day of the week. Yeah. And so unless, unless you have a pretty clear action plan, and it may take two or three years uh, of how you're going to institute or implement uh, meaningful change, you're swimming upstream all the time. And you mentioned something earlier about, did you say something about life balance? Right, if that even exists, but yeah, life balance. Yeah, well, I think that is absolutely necessary. Or, or you know, a, a leader trying to affect change is going to burn out uh, more quickly than even average. Yeah, uh, that, if that yeah. makes any sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks, Gary. Um, I, I think that uh, what somebody tell me one time that three things that great leaders need to have was intellect, belly fire, and a third place that helped keep them balanced in some ways. Yeah. Uh, for some right. that's church, sometimes that's a hobby, sometimes that's whatever that is, but what you need a third place, uh, home and work and something in order that you don't blow up and just kind of keep grinding and grinding. So I totally agree with that. So yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for jumping up here. I'm going to jump and talk about four uh, practical things here real quick. And then um, um, we'll, uh, we'll have another little opportunity to chat amongst ourselves, and then we'll wrap it up. So uh, if um, Mitch is coming. OK, yes. Uh, so what I have to do is, um, because of the way I, I, I loaded the files up, unfortunately, um, I'm going to have to bring you down and put you on the right stage and then bring the files up on the, on the left stage. So uh, give, me, give me a minute, Perfect. and I'll, I'll set everything Thanks, Mitch. Uh, so I, I have four areas. I, you know, I took some foundational things, and I really do think those are necessary. But uh, four areas that are kind of on my heart right now around change leadership. The first is around partnerships. Uh, we are at a day and age where schools and districts just don't have enough resources to be all that they are supposed to be. Um, I mean, we just read this week that you know things like. Uh, poverty and hunger and all of those things are definitely weighing on schools' ability to help kids grow and learn. And so whether these are social service partnerships, whether these are business partnerships, whether these are mentorship partnerships, the best change leaders I know are huge storytellers of what's going on in their organization that helps build culture but they're also gathering more and more resources and more and more people that really want deep partnerships uh, with, the, with their organization. I've seen classroom teachers that do this, and they have adults that are coming in and out of their room all the time. They have people in different countries that they're sharing resources with. But ultimately, um, that piece of the puzzle matters deeply. Uh, the second one is that, um, you know, how do we start to make this change around push-pull curriculum? And so, um, and what I mean by that, and this term is, I'm sure not a new term, but a little bit new to me, is this idea that if you look at any school that we have, I would say 80 to 90% of what kids learn is uh, pushed at them. Here's the curriculum, here are the standards, we're pushing this information to you, you need to absorb it. And we are totally out of balance with that. We know that best practice says that 
kids should be drawing knowledge through their own passions. And that should be pulled through things that they're excited about and engaged about. It's a very artful teacher. It takes a very artful leader to support the fact that we're not just going to push more curriculum and more standards and more ideas to kids. But we're going to start with the kids at the center, their passions right next to them, and we're going to pull content through that. And so people that are really, really deeply changing cultures in schools are finding ways to change that balance. And so uh, my next slide there talks a little bit about that push-pull um, curriculum. And so just making sure that in a deep way that we're thinking about, you know, can kids just keep having more and more pushed on top of them and hope that we get any better results? Uh, my guess is no. And I believe that when I go around the country, I see the best change leaders affecting that balance. The third one, uh, we'll switch over, is about defining success differently. Um, there are a few schools and a few leaders that I have seen that have said, the state test will take care of themselves. The ACT will take care of itself. The smarter balance test will take care of itself. But how are we going to determine whether our kids are successful? On a daily basis, on a weekly basis, at the end of the year, when they leave us in our school district, how are we truly going to define that? You know, that could be the four C's, that could be about critical thinking, but schools that are really making change and leaders that are doing that have a community that believes in a different set of metrics. They have teachers that believe, you know what, if I believe in the process, the products will take care of themselves. Uh, sometimes we're seeing incredible e-portfolios and digital portfolios. Sometimes we're seeing incredible capstone projects. But folks are able to say, we're showing learning differently. And um, that is one of the ways, I think, to practically change what's going on. And so first, the partnerships. Next, thinking about curriculum differently. And then building success differently. And then the last part, and I think that when Gary and I were talking, we talked a little bit about this core mission piece. We need that the highest part of the school district, that someone says, this is what matters. And then if people know that they're doing the right things for kids and it's missional, they have a lot of freedom. And I think teachers really, really enjoy, student leaders enjoy, building leaders enjoy saying, I'm doing good things for kids and it relies on the core mission, now I can be creative. Now I can do things I'm passionate about. Now I can really get energized about the work in the classroom. So I really believe the best change leaders are doing those four things. Uh, and that kind of drives me to um, slide my question number two for us to think about. So how could you support the growth of one of these areas in your learning space? Uh, could you foster additional partnerships? Could you change the balance of how curriculum is delivered or received by kids? Uh, what could you do to build a new set of success metrics? And then what could you do to solidify the core mission so people have freedom, creativity, spontaneity beyond that core mission to really bring great learning to kids? And so bring Mitch back up to uh, talk over that one with me a little bit. Okay, I'm back up. So uh, let me just go through these four areas um, that uh, Bob to discuss in your groups and 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 or click on his icon and, and discuss with him that there are different areas to consider for your school and your district about how you're going to implement a 21st century learning environment. Um, so to one extent, you know. How are you going to be thinking about partnerships? Or how are you going to be thinking about pushing uh, more curriculum or pulling curriculum onto students? Are you going to replace things that they're doing or are you going to put more and more on them? Are you, uh, how are you measuring success? Are you measuring it through the standardized test? Are you measuring it through other means? Are, is, are there qualitative means that you're using to measure how your school is successfully imparting 21st century 
skills with into the students and then to consider what is your school's core mission and you and this may be even a good place to begin what is what are the one two or three really critical things that your school wants to accomplish so over the next couple of minutes if you can discuss these in groups how could you support growth or what can you as an individual do to support growth in one or more of these areas in your learning space i'm going to come down and i'm, I'm going to join the groups also we'll give you a few minutes to discuss this uh, feel free to click on other people's option uh, icons and then uh, we'll bring um, bob up and probably at least one of you uh, to this or or even possibly me uh, to discuss with this with Bob. So I think that uh, a number of you have had a chance to talk and actually I, I uh, had a good chance to um, to to talk also. Uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll bring um, Bob back up. Hope you're ready. Ready or not, here you come. Hi. Hi. So you were um, good. You're, you're talking to Lisa. I was talking to uh, uh, Greg, but um, unfortunately, it looked like he was having some uh, connection problems and he dropped off. But uh, we were having an interesting discussion about um, how he was he was saying that that he would begin with talking with the core, with the, the mission of the school. And uh, and start there, and then maybe go to the other aspects that you brought up. What what are your thoughts? On that? Yeah, you know, I think it's really important. But sometimes, have you ever like uh, paralysis by analysis, right? Like, I'm okay with the yes. core mission evolving. Um, you know, it doesn't need to be so solid that that's the end goal for ten years. Um, the mm -hmm. core mission should evolve uh, over time. It doesn't mean it should be different every day, uh, but we need to be okay with the fact that. We can get together for a short period of time, hammer out where we are, and tinker around the edges and clean it up if we need to over time. And you know, we don't have to produce a, a Rembrandt or Picasso of a, a core mission. We can continue mm -hmm. to tinker and add paint and as we. So I just, uh, I would encourage people not to get stuck in. We have ah. to figure out core mission. We have to figure it out. We have to figure it out. There has to be a good common understanding, but it can change and it can uh, evolve over time. And so um, that would be my only caution to schools is just don't get caught talking about things when you should be doing things. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And one of the things that, that um, you, when you're talking about push versus pull, uh, yeah. you know, one of my favorite expressions, it's an, it's an African expression. And I guess I had a friend from somewhere in Africa when I was growing up. Who I was saying, well, what do you want to do next? This and like, and he just looked at me and he says, you know, Mitch, where I come from, we have this expression which is, for everything you do, there's something that you don't do. And it's like we kind of lose, we seem to lose sight of that. You know, we say, well, you know, something, we have to teach math and we have to teach ELA and we have to teach, um, we have to teach science and we have to teach 21st century skills. You know, but. The what you ha what we have to do is understand. Well, if we want to start teaching 21st century skills, we can't say 21st century skills is our number one priority, and math is our number one priority, and ELA is our number priority, number one priority, and engineering is our number one priority. We have to start saying, well, you know something. If we're going to be doing this, then we have to not teach this. If you're going to teach a, if you're going to teach like the AP courses, they try to uh, they try, try to teach everything. Whereas uh, if you go to a typical college course, very often you're focusing on, 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 certain, on certain areas, which may or may not be more key than other areas, but the process of getting deep into something becomes much more important than the specific thing that you're, that, that you're getting into. And I think, you know, what, I don't know, what do you think? Hear me, yeah, one of the things you'll hear me say, Mitch, at times is that, you know, I haven't seen an innovative high school with a traditional schedule. Um, and so if we're talking about being innovative and we're talking about change, uh, it starts with things like that. Um, and, you know, I was at Montes Monticello High School in Virginia uh, a month or so ago, and they have an incredible math, engineering, science academy that is truly mm -hmm. the most integrated STEM learning over a, a four-year high school period that I've ever seen. And mm -hmm. 
that's uh, we need to figure out how to nest some of these things together. Um, it would be great if that if we had to have 24 credits, six of those were humanities. We didn't call any of them English and any of those social stuff. We had six courses that were STEM. We had six courses that were some sort of elective that you chose. Maybe it was the arts uh, where your community was. And then you had six hours to learn about what you were passionate about. That could be online. That could be whatever that was. Um, we just have to figure out how to nest a lot of this together. And so um, I'll, I'll be yep. excited to see if more and more change leaders can pull that off. So what I'm thinking of doing is I'm thinking of coming down and uh, – and to bring Gary back up, because I think you, you and he were having a good discussion last time, and you may be able to talk about different points. Do you think that would? Yeah, let, yeah. Well, let's do this, Mitch. Can, yeah, well, actually, can we, uh, I, I'd like to hit my last four slides real quick, and then we can finish okay. with some the conversation. Right? It'll only take okay. me about five so, more minutes, so, but I think there's some yep. stuff there I want to get out there. Okay, definitely. I'll come down, and I'll bring your slides back up. So yeah, I, I think it's really important. I love this uh, forum, and I think that I think that folks doing PD this way are, is going to be pretty incredible. Uh, we talked at some length about uh, the foundational stuff we need and the practical stuff we need, uh, and, and these are some things that I'm seeing that are transforming some learning space uh, in some districts. One is that um, we are finding classroom teachers that are leading really wonderful connected classrooms. We are seeing building leaders that are doing that. And at the core of their mission is this idea of story. Uh, and they know that they're in charge of being kind of the storyteller in chief of their areas. And, um, you know, we see superintendents that are putting their district on the map by just being out there telling the story. And again, it's not bragging, but it's telling the story. For teachers, this is about putting videos and photos out in front of everyone. And you can't change mental models in education out the videos and images of what great learning looks like. And so I think if you're trying to change hearts and minds around what education looks like, it has to be with storytelling. And in this day and age, it probably has to do with visual storytelling in a lot of ways and digital storytelling. So uh, change leadership, I think, begins and ends with being able to tell story. And the other piece that story does, it begins to build empathy in the system. And we need students that have empathy for teachers and teachers that have empathy for kids and community members that have empathy for everyone in the organization. And that comes when people know your story. Um, we always have that disparity in the Gallup poll every year where U.S. schools are called a D or an F. And then they're asked, what do you think about your child's school? And it's always a B. And I, I just attribute that to the idea that they know the story of the school in which they participate. And they're only hearing the narrative of the media or the um, you know, unofficial story of schools, and that's why schools get a D. Uh, the next one is really about learning space design, and this can electrify space. Uh, go change one place in a deep way in a school. Is that the library? Is that a computer lab? Is that a commons? Is that a cafeteria? Change one space and tell me that doesn't begin to change the entire culture of a building. We are seeing this all over the country. We're seeing folks do it in inexpensive ways and very expensive ways. But what we know is that it begins to say business is not the same here. Uh, we know the old story of Rip Van Winkle, and they said one of the only things that Rip Van Winkle would recognize after you woke up from being a slumber for 100 years is the inside of a school building, the inside of a the desks are there, the board that teachers write on is there, the teacher standing up in front, and everything else in the world has changed. We have to begin to make change in this area uh, as well as the storytelling area. The third one here uh, that I think is transformational is uh, our conversations about equity. Uh, as many folks know, um, you know, uh, St. Louis uh, has spent uh, quite a bit of time over the last six months talking about race and class and how that affected uh, our community and more recently Baltimore uh, and in other places around the country. Thinking about how do we deal with issues of equity uh, as it relates to giving our kids the best learning environment we can give them. 
Uh, we're starting to really realize that it's the experience gap that's keeping kids from achieving at a very high level. Uh, and so how at a school level can we start to close the experience gap when we know in the summers and the other 18 hours a day, um, kids are getting left behind in poor neighborhoods. The last one here that I think that great change leaders are thinking about are, is this. I call it the long game and the short game. Uh, yes, there's stuff that has to get done. Yes, there are demands by the school board. Yes, there are demands by the community. But the best change leaders are to have a short game that pacifies and takes care of those things and a long game that says, I not only want to give you what you want, but I need to teach you what you need. I think uh, I read something from Seth Godin the other day that said exactly that, is that great change leaders not only give people what they want, but teach people what they need. And I think that's the difference between the long game and the short game. And just one other thing. Uh, the last thing is this work of change is a messy thing. Uh, and I think we have to be open to everyone that change is messy. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be clean. We can't uh, have meetings upon meetings and upon meetings and make it nice and clean. That we just have to get in there and do it. And sometimes we have to make mid-course corrections. Sometimes we have to say we messed up and hope for grace. Sometimes we have to admit failure and say, you know what? Error-based learning is some of the best learning that we can do. Uh, but ultimately, uh, we know that um, change and change leadership is messy. And so I think that's a real really important piece. We're doing this to be transformational. Um, and so bring Mitch back up and we can uh, put a wrap on things here in a few moments. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and I do want to say, I mean, these these slides. Uh, it's not that they have a tremendous amount of text, but everything on these slides was something that was, you know, visually. Uh, the the visuals went with the headline and really contributed to to your discussion. Uh, and I can. Would you mind if I uh, posted the slides up so that people can see them? Uh, people who haven't, who either were here and, and would like a copy of them or, or weren't able to see the live broadcast? Sure, absolutely. And then uh, we also will be recording uh, the, well, we are recording uh, the, this session. So uh, the, my guess is that we'll, we'll, towards the beginning, middle of next week, uh, we'll, we'll be posting a, the archives. And so if people, I, I saw just five minutes ago that somebody else joined our room, um, and unfortunately, you missed uh, a lot of. Them. But if for those of you who who missed this, there there will be an archive that will uh, will also be posting on the on the website. Um, I you know there's just so many things that you brought up which were um, so interesting. The idea of the long term versus the short term, you know, giving people what they want. Um, and also teaching them what what they need. The idea of, of that a lot of people who are running schools and districts are working as managers, whereas what we need right now, as we're transforming education into a you know to more resemble the networked economy, the, the, that whole world is uh, people are being managers and not being leaders, and we, and we need more leadership because we need we need to to change and the. Um, we have to start making choices, don't, and 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 not reacting. Is there a summary? Oh, you know, I should I should also mention if people wanted to learn more about this, how could they get hold of your book? Yeah, a couple of things. One, uh, a lot of these topics I've written blog posts on, and so drrobertdillon.com gets you there. Uh, my uh, new book called Leading Connected Classrooms, which is really for classroom teachers, building leaders, and district leaders. Uh, I, uh, it's there uh, is now available anywhere you uh, go to get books these days. Uh, but you know, I think more importantly, um, the, the summary for me is this: is that um, there are a lot of things that are urgent uh, that we can be a part of each day. We can go down our to-do list, we can do our email, 
we can uh, do things that are truly, truly, um, you know, um, urgent. But we really need to think about what we can do that is significant each day. That, you know, if I do this today, a month from now, I don't have to do A, B, and C as a leader. So if I do this today, I'm going to be empowering someone else to be able to do some incredible things down the road. And so if you were just wanting to leave with one thought is, how can I do less that's urgent? Not that there aren't things that have to be done, but how can I do a few things that are less urgent and do a few more things that are significant? Uh, I think that begins to set the glide path uh, to be a part of the art of change leadership. Well, that's a that's a great ending, and um, and I also like to point out that on Tuesday we're having another Ed Chat Interactive with uh, well, you know something I'm not even sure I have to get his name pronunciation right, but I think it's Andy Marcinek, um, who's another Corwin author, and he's going to be talking about uh, introduce it, having a vision before you introduce technology and to understand how the tech that the purpose of technology is to support the learning that that takes place in the in this classroom and in the school not not in and of itself and so that should be an exciting conversation with Andy on Tuesday um, it's Andy's a great guy into, he is uh, yeah. yeah I was gonna say Andy's a great guy he's done some mad, magical stuff up at uh, Grafton High School I believe uh, in Massachusetts I, I will probably be in the audience for that Oh, that'd be great. And uh, we're heading into Memorial Day weekend. And so I'd like to give a reward for everybody who is here. Um, it's it's Thursday. Everybody, um, you can you can take Monday off. So with that, <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll say goodbye for from uh, Mitch Weisberg and Ed Chat Interactive. And um, thank you so much. I thought, you know, really, really good information and hope to see you all on Tuesday. Thanks. Hey. Hi. I was just finishing my webinar that I was doing. How's you doing? Cool. Did it go well? Yeah. Oh, you had your little thing to do. That's fine. So. Um...